Okay, good morning and welcome to the 12th meeting of the Welfare Reform Committee for 2014. And can I start in the usual manner by asking everyone to make sure that mobile phones and other electronic devices are switched off. Our agenda item one, the first item of business today is a decision on whether to take item five, which is a consideration of the committee's work programme in private. Do members agree? Agreed. Agreed. Thanks very much. We go then to our second item of business today, and that is to take evidence on the from the Deputy First Minister on the affirmative instrument, the Scotland Act 1998, transfer of functions to the Scottish Ministers, etc., Order 2014, which is a draft. The order has been laid under the affirmative procedure, which means that the Parliament must approve the draft before the provisions may come into force. The instrument is also subject to affirmative procedure in both houses of the UK Parliament. The following this evidence session with the Deputy First Minister, the Committee will be invited to consider the motion to recommend approval of the instrument under Agenda Item 3. Agenda Item 3 will be the formal debate on the instrument and therefore the officials accompanying the Deputy First Minister will be unable to speak to the Committee at that point. So I go to uh, the Deputy First Minister and I welcome uh, Nicola Sturgeon to the Committee this morning. Um, she's joined by Owen Griffiths, who is the Policy Officer for the Housing Support and Homelessness Unit, and Jackie Pantoni, I hope I've said that right, sorry, uh, a Principal Legal Officer at the Legal Director of the Scottish Government. Uh, I'll give the, first, the Deputy First Minister the opportunity to make a brief opening statement. Uh, thanks, Convener. Can I start uh, by thanking the Committee for its uh, assistance in this matter, both for uh, applying pressure on the DWP over the matter of the cap on discretionary housing payments and also for agreeing to consider the Section 63 order so quickly. Um, I certainly hope that we are able to uh, see the order complete its parliamentary stages in the Scottish Parliament swiftly so that we can ensure we're playing our part in having uh, the order passed uh, timorously. Uh, I think it's also appropriate for me to record my thanks to the Scotland Office and uh, David Mundell in particular for uh, their assistance and cooperation in making sure we're working to a timetable that is ambitious but one that's designed to ensure that this transfer of power takes effect and the subsequent order that the Scottish Government requires to lay can take effect in this financial year. Um, just very briefly about the order, uh, the Section 63 order transfers the power found in Section 70, Subsection 3, Subsection A of the Child Support, Pensions and Social Security Act 2000. Uh, that power, of course, is one to set the cap on the amount local authorities can spend on DHPs in any financial year. The committee is well aware of the history of the order. Uh, Scottish ministers have explained previously that we believe DHPs are the best way of mitigating the bedroom tax because they're the only way of making regular ongoing payments directly to tenants who are affected by the bedroom tax. Uh, as the committee is aware, the Scottish Government initially asked the DWP to lift the cap for Scotland. Uh, that move would have required a simple negative instrument in Westminster. Uh, the UK government decided to transfer the power uh, to the Scottish government to allow us to lift the cap. And uh, although it's not the process that we initially uh, recommended, uh, we nevertheless welcome uh, the process which will place the power uh, to lift or vary the cap in the hands of Scottish ministers. Um, it's only this order-making power that's been transferred via the Section 63 order. No further powers passed to the Scottish government in respect of DHPs. Uh, the Scotland Office has agreed to the timetable, which uh, I know has been shared with the committee, uh, and the aim of the timetable is for the order to be made at the November meeting of the Privy Council. Um, at this time, I can tell the committee that everything is on schedule uh, from the perspective both of the Scottish Government uh, and, uh, indeed, of the Scotland Office. Uh, so, with those opening remarks, I'd be very keen to hear the views of the committee and, of course, answer any questions. Okay, do members have questions at the moment? Alex. Before we all agreed on the route that we're taking here by lifting the, the cap on the discretionary housing payments, during the discussion that took place in advance of that uh, decision, there were suggestions made by some people, including myself, that other routes may have produced greater flexibility and that by choosing to direct all the resource available through the discretionary housing payment, we may actually be making it difficult to get the, the, the breadth of cover uh, that the money could achieve. Uh, are there, in your view, any areas where taking this route does limit your capacity to act in other ways? Well, obviously, with um, discretionary housing payments, there are uh, 
eligibility criteria for discretionary housing payments and the eligibility criteria, the policy uh, direction of discretionary housing payments continues to be set by Westminster. So somebody in receipt of uh, discretionary housing payment has to be in receipt of mm. housing benefit. Um, I have to say, you know, my view it has always been my view and it continues to be my view that this is the best way of mitigating the bedroom tax and the reason for that as I've set out today and I've set out previously is that it is the only way the Scottish Government uh, via local authorities can get regular and ongoing payments directly into the hands of individuals that effectively compensates them for the amount of housing benefit uh, they, are remo they are losing as a result of the bedroom tax. There is no other uh, way, way within the powers that we currently have that we could do that uh, in that <coughs> way. Uh, so I'm perfectly comfortable that this allows us to do what we've set out the intention to do, which is to take away the impact of the bedroom tax. It won't surprise you to hear, I wish we could just abolish the bedroom tax rather than have to mitigate it, but in the absence of that power, this, uh, without a shadow of a doubt in my mind, is the best way of proceeding. Thank you. Yeah, Ken? Uh, thanks. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy First Minister. Um, the paper before us, the, the uh, support legislation, is an affirmative in instrument, but the actual measure you're going to use to introduce um, the uh, or lift the power to lift the cap is going to be a negative instrument. Can you ask just to explain why one is affirmative, one is negative? Well. One is, uh, the, the tra if, if Westminster had decided just to lift the cap, it would have been by negative instrument. So that is the, the current way of uh, varying the cap. You know, this is affirmative because it is a, a formal transfer of the power to do that. But I think it's appropriate to stick to the uh, current uh, method had it been, been done by Westminster to do that. Um, I should say, you know, the, the Scottish Government at that stage would have uh, two options. We could vary the cap to change it from the level it's at just now uh, to, to raise it to a higher level, or we can remove the cap altogether. Our intention is to remove the cap altogether. Okay. And um, as part of the... Uh, the way that the uh, lifting of the GHP is... or the, the money has begun to local authorities uh, has worked in operation. There have been reports in some areas, I noticed in Falkirk Council in particular, that um, they're not, uh, they've suspended uh, DH payments to some groups unaffected by the bedroom tax. Now I know that you've said this shouldn't happen. I raise it because I've got a, an individual constituent as well with exactly the same situation who's been denied a payment and he fears it's because um, Effectively, those payments have been displaced by the focus on the, on the bedroom tax. Can I ask if there's anything you can do? I know you don't want that to happen. Is there anything you can do to ensure that doesn't happen? Well, the responsibility for administering discretionary housing payments lies with local authorities. And, you know, one of the points I made earlier on is we're only getting the power to, to vary the cap, not to change any of the policy context of discretionary housing payments. I mean... Two issues have arisen in terms of local authorities, and I'll kind of touch on both of them. It's the second one that I think you're particularly touching on. Local authorities uh, were obviously concerned that until the cap is formally lifted, which won't be until later in this financial year, uh, would they be running into legal difficulties if they got to the point before the cap was lifted where they were having to breach that cap? Um, I think we've... Uh, managed to give assurance to local authorities through the joint letter that's been issued from UK and, and the Scottish Government giving uh, comfort around that. So I've been very clear that local authorities uh, should plan on the basis of spending up to the limit of money uh, that they have available. And I've been equally clear, and I'll put it on the record again today, uh, that the money that the Scottish Government is providing for uh, discretionary housing payments is expressly intended to mitigate the bedroom tax. So that means that anybody affected by the bedroom tax who applies for a discretionary housing payment should get a discretionary housing payment with no other uh, means testing uh, applied to that. The second point you're raising is with the focus on uh, mitigating the bedroom tax through discretionary housing payments, are there other uh, uses of discretionary housing payments that are being constrained or curtailed? Uh, I should say at the outset, and I know money is tight in local authorities, you know, once we lift the cap, there'll be nothing to prevent local authorities from within their own resources adding more to discretionary housing payments if they so choose. But even within the amount that's allocated so far, you know, local authorities have, ballpark figure here, 50 
million pounds this year, 35 million of that from the Scottish Government, 15 million of that uh, from the UK Government. Our current estimate of the cost of mitigating the bedroom tax is in the region of 40 uh, million pounds. So there is additional resources available through discretionary housing payments for other purposes. And indeed, you know, if you look at the 15 million pounds from the UK Government, that's split into uh, a core amount, an amount for bedroom tax, an amount for bedroom tax in rural areas, an amount for benefit cap, an amount for uh, local housing allowance. Now, we uh, are of the view that the bedroom tax can be mitigated within the 50 million without touching any of these non-bedroom tax uh, purposes. So uh, there are resources there to be dealing with other uh, claims and discretionary housing payments. Of course, it is then down to individual local authorities to assess those claims in the normal way. Uh, just that, that's very helpful and uh, absolutely in line with my understanding of what your position is in this. Uh, just, just to return though, if there was evidence that some money was that, that um, it, it was having a displacement effect, that some payments that would normally be expected through discretionary housing payments were not being made. Are you mon monitoring that in any way, well, or are you actively intervening in any way? We're looking, you know, we're, we're monitoring discretionary housing payments and the use of that, and we will continue to do that. Um, and we'll continue to discuss with councils their kind of practical experience of this. You know, I've, I've said very, very openly, though, that, you know, with the best will in the world, the Scottish Government cannot, through discretionary housing payments or any other means, uh, you know, compensate for the full uh, impact of benefit cuts. You know, these benefit cuts are taking £6 billion out of the Scottish economy. So we're doing as much as we can. We're doing... I think everything we reasonably can, and we'll continue to look with an open mind at that. Uh, but I, you know, nobody should be out there with the illusion that somehow we've got a bottomless pit of money to put back all of the money uh, that the UK government is is taking out of people's pockets. The only way we'll be able to stop the full impact of that is if we've got the power to uh, stop these uh, changes at source. And one more question, if I may. Um Obviously, you've made some money, well, yourself and the uh, Scottish Government and the Westminster Government have both made money available and local authorities to uh, help with uh, the impact of benefit of the welfare cuts. Um, it's not all been taken up. Now, the, I was just reading some analysis that um, possibly uh, the amount of money that was made available in rural areas may have been an overestimation. Can I just ask for your own thoughts about why there hasn't been the full take-up? Uh, is it because... There's a very difficult, hard-to-reach group. Uh, is it possibly because uh, there was an over-allowance for rural areas? Or, or is there any other explanation why it's not been fully well, taken up? In terms of uh, initial allocation of, of money, we, we are in... I mean, right now we're in the situation where some local authorities, before the, the final tranche of money from the Scottish Government for DHPs has been allocated, we have, I think, 12 local authorities that are already funded uh, adequately to fully mitigate the bedroom tax. So in allocating the remainder of that, and obviously that you know, has to be done in agreement with COSLA, but what we need to do is get that money to the local authorities uh, who need it. So, yes, part of the reason we wanted the cap lifted wasn't just so that we could... Uh, because, remember, the cap applies to individual local authorities as well as to the global sum of money. So part of the reason we wanted the cap lifted was not just so that we could increase the global sum of money, but also so that we can flex that money in terms of where it's getting to so that there's not over allocations in some areas and under allocations in others and that's what we hope to be able to do with the remaining uh, tranche of money uh, but secondly you know i think there is an issue you know again without uh, laboring well i'm going to labor this point because it is an important point the bedroom tax is not abolished um, the bedroom tax is still in existence. People still have a legal liability uh, for the housing benefit uh, loss to, to meet the, the rent that's not covered by housing benefits. So, you know, when I made the statement about this in Parliament, I was very clear, I think you asked a question about it, that, you know, local authorities, housing associations, the government, we have to get the message across that people have to apply for help. And you know as well as I do that that's a, a message that is easier to get across in some groups than it is in others. So there is an ongoing job of work there that we still have to do in order to make sure that people are aware of the help that is available. Um, I know you talk about discretionary housing payments, I think in other aspects of our welfare mitigation work, the, the welfare fund, for example, um, you know, underspends that we saw last year, you know, I think were a feature uh, 
generally speaking, of a new fund bearing in. I don't think we're going to have uh, too much uh, difficulty in getting that money uh, out the door. So, but you know, these are, are issues that we've got to keep at. We can't just assume, particularly when we're talking about the bedroom tax, uh, that everybody that is entitled to help will apply for it. We need to continue, and particularly local authorities, housing associations, landlords have got a particular responsibility there to get that message across. I, I thank you for that reply. Just on the same point, uh, it's just, it's just the, va the variation. Just to let me understand, there's a huge variation, that's all I ask, that between, uh, let's say, North Lanarkshire, this is on the proportion of DHP funding spent. Uh, North Lanarkshire has spent uh, over 100, more than 100%, uh, and whereas Murray, Perth and Kinross are less than 30%. That's quite a, quite a yeah. variation. I was, just, I was just trying to get your and understanding of what's the key reason behind that huge variation. Well, it, can't, it can't just be hard to reach people, I would have thought. No, I mean, some of that will be down to the, the differing uh, impacts of the bedroom tax and an initial situation where the allocation of the funding was not necessarily mirroring uh, where the greatest demand was, which is what we are trying to fix now with the flexibility of not having the cap. Um, you know, so repeat the point I made earlier on, the, the cap had a double effect, has, because it's still in place, a double effect in the sense that uh, it limits what you can spend in a global sense, but it also limits uh, what can be spent in individual areas. So, uh, you know, some local authorities with, you know, their, uh, you know, maximum allocation under the cap still didn't have enough to mitigate all of the bedroom tax where other local authorities uh, perhaps had too much for that given the uh, lesser demand for it. So getting rid of the cap helps us to sort the, the allocation as well as ensure that there's enough money overall. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Convener. Thank you. Uh, can you my question isn't so much uh, about the, the policy objective of the, the instrument, which is something that I think, well, we'll find out in a minute, but I think the whole uh, committee it agrees with it's more a procedural one, uh, Deputy First Minister, uh, and it's about the role of uh, Westminster Parliament uh, after presumably we agree this instrument today. What, what is, how does that work exactly? What's the the, the time scale and the the uh, procedure? Do both houses of Westminster Parliament have to uh, consider this, and are we expecting that to be a, a straightforward process? Um, I would hope it's a, a straightforward process, but obviously that part of the process is not entirely within uh, my control. The order uh, is expected to pass through uh, both the House of Commons and the House of Lords in October, so the uh, relevant uh, House of Commons uh, committee is scheduled to meet on the 14th of October, the House of Lords uh, Grand Committee the 23rd of October, and then the anticipation is there would be an emo a motion to approve uh, in the House of Lords on the 27th of October. So as I said, all of that is on track at the moment, but we continue, uh, as you would expect, to monitor progress um, and contribute where we can to ensure that that process remains on track. But uh, responsibility for the Westminster, Westminster side of this process obviously lies with the Scotland office. But you know, David Mandel and I, and I uh, are in uh, contact uh, when we need to be to ensure that this uh, process keeps going at pace. Presumably that, that timescale is still contingent on uh, this Parliament dealing with our side of it Indeed. in time as well. Uh, one final quick question about the, the, the procedure. I know there was, uh, I think there was a bit of frustration. I'm sure you were frustrated as well that the, there was a bit of a delay in so far as the, I think they had to wait for the Privy Council to, to bring this. If or, is their role now completely, this doesn't go back to them, does it? Uh, yes, the Privy Council has to approve this and uh, the expectation uh, assuming everything stays on track, is that will happen at the November meeting of the Privy Council. There is a sort of fallback where it could happen in, in December, but the preference is for that to happen at the, the November meeting of the Privy Council. And again, we're hoping that's a straightforward process as well. Yeah, I'm not familiar with the inner workings of the Privy Council, but I'm, I'm hoping so. OK, thank you. OK, uh, the committee is joined by Jackie Bailey there this morning. I'll come to Jackie for the next question. Much convener. Um, whilst uh, Deputy First Minister and I would, would probably argue over the fact that there are other ways of doing this, I very much welcome the fact that the order is before us today. Um, could I ask, because the letter of comfort signed by both governments was indeed welcome, is she aware that there is continuing reticence on the part of some local authorities um, to provide full DHP now? Well, there shouldn't be. 
Um, and if anybody wants to bring uh, evidence of particular uh, reticence in any local authority to me, then I will you know, endeavour to discuss that with uh, local authorities. It is their uh, responsibility. Discretionary housing payments are their responsibility to administer. I don't have power of direction of local authorities in these matters, but there is no reason uh, why uh, local authorities should be reticent about mitigating the bedroom tax through discretionary housing payments. Okay, that's very helpful. Um, you mentioned the question of um, additional money being available because the estimate for the bedroom tax was now at 40 million. Um, there are cases of people who are being threatened with eviction, one of them, one of my constituents, um, in a local authority area where they failed to fully spend the money last year. Um, they're being threatened with eviction as a result of, um, uh, if you like, not quite non payment, but inability to afford the bedroom tax from last year. Um, given those additional resources that you referred to that are available, would you consider backdating in circumstances Again, like that? You know, the, the additional resource, I think to, to talk about additional resources is slightly misleading because to go back to uh, Ken McIntosh's point, there are other calls on discretionary housing payments that you know people uh, have recourse to discretionary housing payments for reasons other than the bedroom tax. Um, uh, speaking on behalf of SNP councils, uh, SNP councils were always very clear that uh, there would be no evictions uh, as a result of people who were trying to pay but couldn't pay because of, of the bedroom tax, and I would encourage all local authorities uh, to take that position. It is open uh, to local authorities. Uh, you know, there were underspends last year in uh, some local authorities uh, in terms of this money. It is open to local authorities to backdate uh, discretionary housing payment support, but that is a matter for them. I cannot instruct them to do so. So I would encourage you to uh, liaise and engage with the local authority in your area, uh, which I, I believe you know well, uh, on that or any other particular case. Indeed, I have two, um, Deputy First Minister. I'm interested in what you said about backdating. I take it they can backdate beyond one financial year. Um, and just to note, it isn't just a question of councils. This indeed was a housing association um, because, of course, Argyll and Butte Council did a full stock transfer. Well, yeah, I don't know the details of uh, the constituency case you um, are referring to. Obviously, I'm, I'm pretty sure you'll pursue that uh, vigorously. Um, and rigorously in the best way you can. There is discretion on the part of local authorities to backdate uh, across financial years, but that is a discretion that rests with them, um, and that's why I would encourage you to uh, discuss that with them. On the basis that you said that, let me not call it additional money, but there is um, money available in the budget uh, because the bedroom tax is estimated to be 40 million rather than the 50 million previously thought. Um, would you be encouraging local authorities to use their discretion to backdate for people who are subject <coughs> and threatened with eviction as a consequence? I think that of would depend on, on the circumstances. You know, okay. the money in this financial year is there to mitigate the bedroom tax in this financial year. There is discretion to local authorities, but local authorities have to be mindful of the other calls and discretionary housing payments. They are perfectly able to exercise that judgment and you know I, I have uh, every uh, confidence that local authorities are able to, to do so and you know if there are particular cases that merit that then I would encourage local authorities to, to look at them sympathetically but the decision rests with them. I suppose what I'm asking you is whether you would favour an approach. I'm not, I'm not going actually, to. I'm not. I'm not going to sit here and uh, endorse or encourage a blanket approach because I think it depends on particular circumstances. Uh, the money we've made available to local authorities uh, for this financial year is to mitigate the bedroom tax in this financial year. So you're ruling out on that basis. If it's mitigation in this financial I, I year, Jackie you're Bailey ruling is, out. No, I, I think clarity. Trying to no, 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 absolutely not. Saying. We'll get a clearer uh -huh. perspective. I, I, I genuinely just want clarity because there are people caught yeah. in the position where they are threatened with eviction because of bedroom tax arrears okay. for last year. Okay. So I am let, genuinely seeking clarity. Let, let me try to do it in, in simple terms for the benefit of Jackie Bailey. Uh, Thank local you. authorities have that discretion and it's entirely up to them whether they choose to exercise that discretion in any individual case to backdate support. Thank you. Well. Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning, Mr. First Minister. Um, I just wanted to uh, uh, raise two brief points. One, just going back to Ms Bailey's comments on mitigation. I mean, obviously, uh, this is a policy area that, over which Westminster uh, has control and what 
uh, our Scottish Government is doing is mitigating the harmful impacts of a Westminster policy. Uh, and, and that leads me to the second point, which I think you've referred to earlier, which is very important, is that this measure today will not abolish the bedroom tax in Scotland, uh, but will rather mitigate the impact uh, of it. Uh, and therefore, that begs the question that surely it is this Parliament that should have the control over such matters uh, and not the Westminster Parliament. And further, that the only way to guarantee that this Parliament can control such matters is to vote yes on the 18th of September. Uh, yes. Um, you know, I, we're not abolishing the bedroom tax here. We're mitigating the bedroom tax. Now, you know, I don't want to see people suffer as a result of an iniquitous policy imposed by a government we didn't vote for. That's the position we're in right now. Uh, but you know, I didn't come into politics to mitigate the policies of Westminster governments. I came into politics because I wanted to have the ability uh, with others to take decisions that avoid bad uh, policies and hopefully implement good policies that make people's lives better. And it, it is just, in my view, beggar's belief, and it's beyond my comprehension why politicians, particularly those uh, of a, a different persuasion to the current Westminster government, would be happy with a role of mitigation when you could take these powers into your own hands and trust yourselves to use them better. But I'll leave those who are in that rather absurd position to explain it, because I can't. Thank you. Well, I mean, it has to be said that some of those politicians didn't bother to turn up to vote in the House of Commons, comments, which uh, could have uh, 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 done something about it. But there we go. That's not really a new uh, thing. But I think it's very important that the point is made that this is not abolishing the bedroom tax, sadly, because, as we've heard, we don't at the moment sadly have the power to do so, but hopefully quite soon. I, I didn't know if there was a question there or not. We're going to have a debate on the issue, so maybe we'll, we'll get to that point then. Um, in finishing the questions, uh, Deputy First Minister, I'll just come back to this uh, uh, point that you're making about the DHP route being the only way available uh, to address this problem. But when the Housing Minister was before us, I asked uh, her a question about discussions that were ongoing with other local authorities about their preferred option in relation to the, the dispersal of funds to support people affected by the bedroom tax. Um, we know that Audit Scotland had approved Renfrew Council's um, means of, of doing that. Uh, and in my own area, North Lanarkshire Council were pursuing a route uh, which was, was also being used by some local authorities in England. Um, the Housing Minister's officials confirmed that discussions were taking place with North Lanarkshire Council about alternative ways of That's distributing this money. Can you confirm whether those discussions have concluded? Are well, you going to continue discussing those alternative options? I'm not aware of any appetite to do that. I mean, there's no, there's no mystery here. You know, when we didn't have agreement from the UK government to allow us to, either for them to raise the cap or allow us to do it, uh, we said we would look at other options. But we'd always been very clear that, in our view, this was the best option. The best option because... Uh, unlike other options, it gets uh, it has the ability to get regular ongoing payments directly to tenants that avoid them getting into debt, which I think is quite an important part of this. So, you know, yes, we were prepared to consider other options, but this is the best way. And now we've got the power to do it the best way. That's the way uh, we're, we're opting to do it. And so I think that's absolutely the right uh, thing to do. So my question is, have you ruled those other options out? Are discussions I, still ongoing? I, 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 about we're, we're, rooting, we're rooting the money that we have set aside to mitigate the bedroom tax through this route because it's the best option. Uh, and I'm, you know, I'm not aware of other options that are better than this one. And I, I, I don't see why we would you know, have discussions to try to come up with second best options when we are securing the power to do it in the best way possible. But in, in the particular case I'm talking about, I was approached by officials from North Lanarkshire Council to ask that question of the Housing Minister. They, they believe that their uh, preferred option, um, which required the approval of, of the Scottish Government ministers, was better than DHP. That was their view. Do they have that discretion to use a different method from DHP, or are you saying that this is the only one that they this, can This use? is where the Scottish Government financial support is, is going to, through discretionary housing payments. Councils have a range of discretion to do a range of different things. I, I can't you know, direct or, or stop them doing that, but in terms of but the you money... Can, according to uh, Audit Scotland, you can approve alternative well, methods. I, I'm not... I, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to come back to you on this point, but I'm, I'm not aware of any you know, request for approval of that. But the, the Scottish Government's financial support to mitigate the bedroom tax is being rooted through discretionary housing payments. 
And that's, you know, that's now if, if local authorities want to do other things in addition to that, then, you know, we'll always be prepared to discuss and, you know, and enter into uh, dialogue about that without, you know, I'm not sitting here just now giving uh, guarantees or, or saying where those discussions would end up. But this is the, the best route, in our view, to mitigate the bedroom tax, which is why uh, we are routing our financial support for that through this route. Okay. Um, that appears to be the end of questions. Uh, so we go to agenda item three, which is the formal debate on the affirmative instrument. And we have scheduled 90 minutes for this debate, but I'm not encouraging members to use that. Um, can I remind the committee uh, and others that during the formal debate, uh, officials cannot speak uh, in that uh, discussion. So I invite the ministers to speak to and move motion S4M10739 in her name. Uh, formally moved. Okay, thanks, Deputy First Minister. Uh, do members have any contributions that they want to make? I think we can then uh, put the question that motion S4M10739 that the Welfare Reform Committee recommends that the Scotland Act 1998 transfer of functions to the Scottish Ministers, etc. Uh, order be approved. I think that has completed uh, that part of the business this morning. Uh, thanks very much to everyone for their contributions. I'll take a couple of minutes just to allow members to to change, I think we have to change some of the seating arrangements. Suspend. I'll suspend the meeting for a few minutes.
Okay, the fourth item on our agenda this morning is the Scottish Government's response to the Expert Group on Welfare and Constitutional Reform Report. As members will recall, the committee took evidence from Martin Evans, Lynn Williams and David Watt of the Expert Working Group at its meeting on the 24th of June. Today provides the committee with an opportunity to take evidence on the Scottish Government's response to the report. So uh, we are uh, still uh, joined by the Deputy First Minister for that purpose. But she is now joined by Susan Anton, the uh, economist at the Welfare Analysis, and Edward Orr, Senior Policy Officer of the Welfare Division of the Scottish Government. So again, I'll invite the Deputy First Minister to make uh, some introdu introductory comments on the report. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Convener. I'll be uh, reasonably brief in my opening remarks. Um, I want to start by uh, placing on record my thanks to the Chair, Martin Evans, and all of the members of the expert group on welfare. I know they were before the committee uh, before the summer recess. Um, I think the report they have produced for our consideration is a very uh, solid, uh, robust and comprehensive report, and coupled with the first report of the expert group, uh, I think would provide a newly independent Scotland with a very, very solid foundation on which to build a better, uh, more fit for purpose uh, welfare system. Uh, I think it's also appropriate for me to uh, point out with uh, sadness that I'm sure will be shared by all of the committee that one of the members of the group, uh, Professor Ailsa Mackay, sadly uh, passed away before uh, the group could conclude its work. Uh, I know that the input she was able to make to the group was hugely valuable and I've got no doubt that she would have continued to make a, a valuable contribution but I want to put on uh, record my thanks uh, to her uh, for the work she did here and the enormous contribution she's had in this area of policy uh, over a long period of time. Um, this uh, report that we're discussing today, as I said, was the second report of the, the expert group. Uh, the, the group's first report was a technical uh, report uh, looking at the costs of welfare in an independent Scotland and the infrastructure that was already in place to support delivery uh, of the welfare system. The group in that report found that the Scottish Government forecasts were a reasonable estimate of the costs involved um, and indeed the UK Government's own analysis paper uh, mirrored those estimates. Uh, on delivery, we know that Scotland is already well placed to deliver the functions needed for a welfare system. Indeed, the group found that Scotland delivers almost all parts of the current UK benefit system to people living in Scotland from locations within Scotland, and we also deliver significant services uh, to England, which run uh, into the millions. For the second report, um, I asked the group to look at future options for change, including the principles that should underpin reform, how these principles might be reflected in helping support people into work, and how, as a society, we best support those who can't work and help them uh, to have a, a decent standard of living and also contribute fully to society. It wasn't an easy remit, but I think the group has come up with a very uh, solid piece of work uh, dealing with key issues such as in-work poverty while outlining a way forward forward that we put trust back into the system. Uh, the report obviously details some 40 uh, recommendations, but I think what is striking is the finding at the heart of it that we have a system where trust has broken down, uh, both the trust of the wider public in believing that their tax contribution is contributing to a fair system, but also trust in recipients of uh, the welfare system that they um, are being treated with dignity and respect um, and that their contribution is also being recognised. I'm not going to run through all of the recommendations because um, I know we'll get into the detail of some of these in our discussion. Uh, there were a number of recommendations, though, in the report that uh, the government indicated uh, immediately that we would accept, so the establishment of a national convention, increasing carers' allowance, restoring the link between benefits and the cost of living, abolishing the bedroom tax, replacing the current system of sanctions, and abolishing the current work capability assessment uh, that determines the ability to work of the sick and disabled. There were a range of other uh, recommendations that we are looking at uh, very carefully because they have, uh, there is a need to uh, consider them in all of their complexity, but we're looking uh, very favourably at uh, these other recommendations, not least uh, the one that suggests we should over time be increasing the minimum wage uh, to match the living wage, something that I think would be hugely important to help uh, deal with the growing problem we have in this country of in-work poverty. We're also uh, looking at alternatives to the work programme, how we support those with a disability uh, enter and stay in work and the proposal for the introduction of a new social security um, allowance. Uh, final comment is 
One of the things I thought was uh, most uh, powerful uh, about the report, and it's something that I think all of us require to, to give further thought to, is this suggestion that we need a radically different way of supporting uh, sick and disabled people. And the analogy with, was drawn with the very uh, concerted efforts that uh, were brought to bear on lifting pensioners uh, out of poverty. We need a similar holistic uh, approach to dealing with those with long-term disabilities uh, who are not uh, likely to be capable of using work as a route out of poverty. So, in summary, I, I was very pleased with this report. I think it gives us a solid uh, base to work on and I'd be uh, very keen to hear the committee's views and answer questions. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy First Minister. Uh, can I kick off just by um, raising some of the issues that the, the, um, Martin Evans uh, brought to us when he spoke to the committee? He said that, they, uh, uh, apart from the, the remit that, that you uh, explained in terms of options and principles, he said that you've been given no cost constraints. Can you explain the, the rationale for for that aspect of the, the agreement? The committee was asked to look with a, a, a fairly open mind. I think, as Martin Evans uh, did explain at some length to the committee, they operated within, broadly speaking, the, the financial envelope of the current cost and the estimated cost over the next few years of delivering uh, the welfare system uh, in Scotland. But they weren't, uh, at the outset of their work, uh, restricted in terms of uh, a cost envelope. They were asked to look uh, creatively and imaginatively. They did look at some uh, fairly radical uh, different options, including the idea of a citizen's income, although they didn't recommend that. But uh, one of their key or one of the key themes uh, running through uh, their report is, yes, there are uh, aspects. I mean, I'm, uh, I th think, fairly well known, as are other members of uh, this committee, as a, a critic of the cuts that have been imposed uh, by Westminster. I think there are uh, big aspects of the, the current uh, direction of travel that we shouldn't carry on with, the uh, move to universal credit and personal independence payments. I think the uh, move to restore uh, some link, the, the key link between benefits and the cost of living uh, is really, really important. Increasing carers' allowance, these all have cost implications. But the uh, central theme of what uh, much of what the report was talking about is how we use current resources better, particularly to help those who are furthest away from the labour market into work. Uh, but do you accept that there will be cost implications? Some people have suggested that ab about £350 million, um, looking at the, the recommendations of the committee, that's figures that have been bandied about. Do you recognise those figures? I, I, I don't know where that particular figure comes from, so no, I don't uh, accept that no. figure. I'm happy to That's part of start-up costs and other well, let's, implications. Uh, well, I'm happy to deal with start-up costs, to use your terminology there separately. I'm assuming you're talking at the moment in terms of uh, the cost of delivering uh, a welfare system. Now, the report is very open about some of the uh, cost implications of uh, some of the proposals it's making. So increasing carers' allowance, so that carers' allowance matches uh, job seekers' allowance. I think, I hope everybody would agree that it's uh, not really acceptable that carers who contribute so much have the lowest uh, level of benefit of any uh, group in society. So uh, the cost of doing that is uh, set out in the report at, I think, around £32 million. The cost of uh, restoring the link between benefits and CPI, obviously the precise cost of that depends on the level of CPI. Of course, the UK government say they plan to restore that link from, I think, 2017-18, and that cost is factored into their projections. Whether they actually do that or not remains to be seen, um, I suppose. But you know, much of what this report is talking about, and I think this is what's very welcome about it, is about how you use resources better to get people into work, and then, crucially, how you ensure that when people are working, uh, they're earning a standard of uh, remuneration that lifts them out of poverty. You know, I, again, I would hope this would be a point of agreement around this table, that one of the biggest challenges we face right now is in-work poverty. So you know, they talk about the potential savings, which are based on uh, estimates of very estimable organisations around what you could save over time to the public purse if you're not having the state subsidising low pay, but instead people paid at the living wage. Um, in terms of set-up costs, if you want me to answer uh, yeah, be, that, yeah. that point, you know, the issues around transition set-up are, you know, as you are aware, dealt with in uh, the White Paper, Chapter 4 and Chapter 10, in particular of the White Paper, uh, deal with issues around welfare. I think when the committee was before you, their view of that, given the, uh, the, the degree of 
delivery infrastructure that already exists in Scotland, almost the entirety of the welfare system in Scotland is delivered from locations in Scotland and by staff in Scotland. So I think well, I don't want to put words in the expert group's mouth, but I think what they were saying is they think that is uh, broadly uh, neutral. Uh, Professor Dunleavy's work obviously looked in some of this at, in greater detail, and I think he drew, uh, and I don't know whether this is where the figure you quoted to me at the outset comes from, but he drew the distinction between pure setup costs and what he termed investment costs. So in welfare, for example, uh, a Scottish government would invest in new systems, uh, IT systems, to support uh, a new welfare system over time. But, you know, as Professor Dunleavy says, these are investment costs in more efficient ways of delivering systems. And, you know, as part of the UK, we pay our share of new computer systems uh, anyway. Uh, so, you know, I'm happy to get into any of these particular points in more detail, but that's uh, the general thrust. Yeah. I'll just ask one more question before opening up to the rest of the committee. As you pointed out, the, the expert group uh, suggested a national convention on welfare and to be set up around about 2015. Um, will financial sustainability be part of the remit of that commission, which you would have to establish? And what restrictions might you place on their considerations uh, you know, to ensure you know, the, 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 con the 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 fiscal constraints that you would be operating under are, are taken into consideration? F Financial sustainability, fiscal sustainability, should be one of the cardinal principles of any responsible government. I know when you've got a UK government sit sitting on a one and a half trillion pound debt mountain, it's kind of hard to believe that it has been for UK governments down the the years. But you know, I'm a member of a government that balances the books every year, so that uh, attention to uh, sustainability and to fiscal uh, responsibility is is vital. Now, we start from the position in Scotland, which is a very strong position, and the expert group in both of the reports draw attention to this. Uh, we start from a position where social protection, and the, the term social protection obviously encompasses uh, welfare, pensions, uh, takes up a smaller proportion of our national income, our national economy, than is the case across the UK. So we start from a more sustainable uh, and affordable position. Uh, and obviously everything we do, whether in welfare or anything else, has to be done uh, with the, the determination to be financially responsible. But one of the big challenges, and I actually would say it's one of the big opportunities in doing welfare better, is that you uh, design your welfare system in a way, you align it with your uh, systems of employment and your uh, approach to the minimum and living wage in a way that is very much focused about getting folk into work and making sure uh, work does pay uh, decently for people so that you're not having people in work dependent on uh, the welfare system. So, you know, this idea that, you know, Scotland can't afford a decent welfare system and shouldn't be aspiring to have a welfare system that is better than the one we've got and actually is represents a better use of taxpayers' money is not one that I hold to at all. Do, do your figures take into account the secret oil field off Shetland? Uh, is that a serious question? Um, I'm a, prepared to answer if it's a well, uh, serious if you want to ask, question. It's a, a our, question. I mean, our figures take are your figures based on the our, published our, figures from the OBR or figure, the ones that you've well, used in the, you, the Parliament, or does it include this secret oil field? Uh, I'm not going to go into you know a, a question about secret oil fields because I think that would probably be demeaning the purpose of. Uh, this committee. Our oil projections, as you know, are published. They take account of a range uh, of estimates. They're in uh, line with industry estimates for production. Um, in terms of uh, the projections around uh, the price of oil, uh, they uh, project a flat cash uh, price per barrel of oil, which actually in real terms is about a 10% reduction. So they are cautious uh, oil projections. And, you know, our uh, fiscal projections take account uh, of of those, and you know I, I would hope all of us uh, would see our vast oil uh, wealth as a country as a an advantage, a bonus, something we should be proud of, and uh, look to make sure benefits more people in future than perhaps it has in the past, not something to be uh, uh, ridiculed. Okay. However, well, however well, much suggest you may have been uh, <laughs> intending it. Indeed, convener. Uh, Deputy First Minister, De bleh, try that again. Deputy First Minister, uh, you have uh, uh, mentioned a couple of times the Scottish Government's accepting the, the recommendation to 
uh, increase the level of carers allowance the same as uh, job seekers allowance. Just wonder if you could spell out exactly what does that mean for someone who'd be in receipt of it and, and indeed how many people would uh, benefit by that? Um, well, it goes to uh, carers allowance, as I've just said, is the um, lowest of all of the uh, benefit levels that are paid right now. So our proposal uh, would take uh, carers allowance uh, from £61.35 uh, to £72.40, um, which you know would be of significant benefit to, to carers. I, you know, I want to be very clear that I don't see this as you know, the be-all and end-all uh, of the support that government owes to carers. You know, carers do an absolutely uh, invaluable job for society. Um, you know, I know that many carers have other issues around carers' allowance in terms of the threshold, uh, the you know, number of hours that they are allowed to work, how carers' allowance interacts with other benefits. And I think these are all things that you know, absolutely require to be looked at as part of an a bigger uh, review of the, the benefit system. But I do think it is an important statement of intent and also an, an important statement of the value we attach to the contribution that carers make to say that they shouldn't be getting uh, a level of benefit that is a low, uh, below basic job seekers' allowance. I mean, it must be, I think what you just said there, uh, uh, some uh, in excess of £500 a year. between £500 and £600 a year, yeah. So that would be very welcome, I would have thought, for, for most uh, carers there. Uh, I noticed yesterday you were at uh, Greater Maryhill Food Bank uh, in relation to, again, I'm sure the very welcome uh, announcement of uh, support uh, for that institution and other uh, organisations uh, doing work on the ground. And, of course, uh, we as a committee uh, have uh, published a report on food banks and established that the UK government's welfare reforms are uh, a, a huge driver uh, in the increase uh, in utilisation of uh, such uh, organisations, uh, and none more so than the, the sanctions uh, regime and Again, the committee has published the report on sanctions. We say we accept the need for conditionality, but it should be backed by a greater support. And I think the expert group have said something similar. What's the Scottish Government's perspective in relation to the, the recommendation and, and sanctions more generally? Um, I, uh, I support the, the thrust of what the expert group have said on sanctions. Um, I mean, the expert group is, I think, quite clear, although there are you know, obviously differences of opinion around this kind of issue, that you know, some form of conditionality in any benefit system uh, has a, a role to play. But the real concern, and it's a concern you know, I share from the experience of dealing with constituents, as I'm sure every member around the table uh, will, is that the current sanctions regime is you know, very, very indiscriminate. It's very uh, heavy-handed. It leads to real inequity and to real hardship on the part of a lot of people, particularly people uh, who have children. Uh, you know, I, as I'm sure other members have, I have people at my surgeries in my constituency office who find themselves on sanctions without any real understanding of why they're on a sanction. Um, and But the implication of that is often that they're without any means of supporting their kids for however long that sanction is, is lasting. So I think we need to have a, a system that is much more supportive, that is uh, much more about supporting people through the difficulties they face in getting into work rather than just slapping on sanctions uh, for uh, often reasons that are difficult to fathom. In terms of food bank um, demand, you know, I... You know, keep hearing, um, and it was put to me in an interview uh, yesterday, and I should say the interview was only putting it to me as being somebody else's view, but this view that the DWP puts forward, that the rise in demand for food banks is because we've got more food banks, and folk just decide to go to food banks. That is just insulting beyond measure to people who have to go through the what must be you know, real trauma uh, and indignity of, of going to a food bank. The rise in demand for food banks, 400% increase in demand over the last year, is down to the cuts in benefit provision that w Westminster are, are implementing. That's the hard reality. The uh, uh, experts from Heritage Watt University made that point as well. It's uh, definitely not uh, uh, supply-led, it's definitely demand-led. Uh, uh, Sadly, uh, one last question, uh, uh, convener, uh, and uh, at least a, a lot of the early work of, of this committee uh, through the USA process, we had a lot of witnesses who uh, came uh, through the work capability assessment uh, process, uh, come to, to speak to us about their experience, uh, invariably, in fact, I think universally, uh, negative. And uh, again, the expert group uh, has uh, posited a, a change uh, for the work capability assessment. They say it should be scrapped and replaced with something 
a little bit more enabling, more of a, a partnership uh, philosophy. How does the Scottish Government respond to that? Uh, well, again, I agree with the recommendation. Obviously, there's work to be done in terms of the, the detail of what would replace that. Um, I, I think it's fair to say, um, and, and again, this is a view born out of experience, that the, the work capability assessment has led to some, uh, you know, quite, you know, horrendous uh, cases of stress and anxiety on the part of people that are put through that now. You know, any system like that has to be uh, humane, it has to be personal. I think those, these assessments should always be carried out by clinicians. Um, I personally don't believe it's the kind of system we should be outsourcing to private companies. I think it is so fundamental a part of how we support people with disabilities that it should be uh, a role of, uh, of government. Uh, and so therefore, you know, I think uh, there is a real need to put in place something that is much more fit for purpose. Um, as I said, you know, very frankly, there's some careful consideration of exactly what form uh, that takes. But the current system, uh, I think, is deeply, deeply discredited. Thank you. Hey, Alex. Yes. Um, going back to the, the money issues that the convener raised uh, in the opening remarks, the, the Minister, um, the Cabinet Secretary, talk, talks regularly about cuts uh, and puts a, a broad figure on these cuts, which again, she mentioned earlier in today's meeting, of £6 billion. Uh, could you give me a, a rough breakdown of where that £6 billion comes from? A, is it a, an annual figure? Is it a five-year figure? Is it a ten-year figure? The Scottish figure? Government, I, I don't have it in front of me, I'm happy that it's published. You know, the Scottish Government has published uh, an analysis of that, which I'm pretty sure mm -hmm. has been drawn to the attention of the committee before, so I'm happy to make uh, yeah, that but available. The, I'm, I'm looking for a basic indication of uh, what that what time period that £6 billion relates it's to, because it has no meaning unless 2015, we know. 2015 is, so the, the four years, I think, up to 2015-16. Uh, but as, as I say, that is it's a published document by the Scottish Government, so I'm more than happy to so it's uh, a, draw it, to your attention It's a again. figure that uh, extends over four years, is that the case? It, over years up to 2015-16. Yeah, so it's 16. an accumulated yes. figure. Mm -hmm. the, when you talk about that accumulated figure uh, and... You talk about it in very general terms. That appears to sound like a commitment uh, to return that money to the benefit system. Well, so Yet, in an early an earlier answer, you said that when you asked the committee to look at welfare, you made an assumption that it would be roughly within existing uh, figures. So, what um, is there a commitment to return that money uh, to the welfare system in Scotland, or is that just a, a vague commitment designed to sound? attractive to people who are no, the, in a desperate situation? No, there is a, a real commitment to undo uh, that. some of that, that. Now, we can't go... Some of that, for, that £6 billion, for example, has come from, uh, over uh, the last few years, the link between benefits and tax credits and uh, the cost of living not being uh, maintained. So the, uh, one per the freeze and then 1% cap, uh, we, we can't go back years and you know, undo the damage that's been done, but we can, going forward, say, as I have said today, that we will guarantee the link between benefits uh, and the cost of living. Similarly, uh, you know, much of uh, the impact on disabled people, for example, is coming from the transition from DLA to personal independence payments, and we're saying very clearly uh, we will not continue uh, with the rollout of personal independence payments. Now, exactly uh, the... Uh, cost implications of that and over what period of time depend on, because we still don't know the precise timetable for the UK government's intended rollout of that, uh, but we you know, do not agree uh, with that, that change. So there are some very clear uh, and very tangible ways in which we are we, we cannot turn the clock back. You know, I wish we could in some respects, but in moving forward from the point that we have control over the benefit system, uh, there are things we will do very differently to stop the impact uh, falling on the most vulnerable in our society. So reductions in tax credits are actually included in your figure of £6 billion. The, that figure includes the uh, not rising, not, it's a figure about the money that's been taken out of the economy mm -hmm. and the impact on real but people. There are, there are substantial changes in the, the tax system that taken as a whole... But it's uh, a net, have, that, that, that figure there is have a net been, But figure. there have been significant reductions in tax credits, but that has been as part of a cha general changes within the tax system, which at the same time saw the basic 
the, the tax threshold increase to the extent that people are between £800 and £1,000 better off? Well, you know, uh, that figure is that looking change. at the net impact of changes on individuals. Now, you know, I'm sorry if it's uh, you, not you, palatable. You use the phrase net impact, but surely if you want to take the net impact, you have to balance one change in the tax system with another. If you simply take one change and count that as a cut without taking the other change into account, that I is think there's expressly not a net impact. Well, the, what, what I'm saying, I think there's plenty of, of evidence from a, a range of different organisations that the changes you're talking about in terms of uh, raising the tax allowance, for example, uh, do not compensate uh, for the range of other changes uh, for every single person. Now, there are, you know, it stands to reason that when you have uh, tax credits and benefits not keeping costs, uh, keeping pace with the cost of living, when you've got significant changes to benefits for disabled people that are taking money out, you know, that has an impact and, and that impact is what we've tried to quantify in the way that uh, you're, you're talking about. So we've moved now from talking about gen cuts in general uh, to being more concerned about the specifics rather than the headline figure. I'm not sure what well, the headline figure is important because that's the money that's been taken taken out of, of people's pockets. But what we are trying to focus on is the impact on individuals, the kind of impact that is resulting in some individuals ending up at the door of a, a food bank. You know, these are real life uh, impacts that you know people are experiencing every day right now that are pitching up, certainly at my constituency surgeries, I can't speak for everybody. Um, these are real live impacts of changes that are happening uh, right now and are planned to continue to happen by the government in Westminster. Now, you can, it is perfectly valid to argue that, you know, if that's the position you want to argue, that this is all for the right reasons and this is all perfectly justified, uh, but you can't deny the impact it's having on particular groups of people. So taken in, it, in its entirety, would the proposals of the expert working group on welfare reform have the effect of reversing the cuts you're talking about? I'm setting out where we would in future do... We, we can't reverse things that have happened in the past. For example, people losing money because their tax credits or their benefits haven't increased in line with inflation. But in future, we can make sure that that link is maintained. Uh, similarly, we can say, as we are saying, we're not going ahead with certain changes. We're not going ahead with the rollout of universal credit. We're not going ahead with the rollout of personal in independence payments. Uh, so there are uh, consequences uh, of that. And you know, that is, these are very firm commitments that, that we're making. It will be for other parties when we get into this scenario to uh, decide on their own policy and what commitments they want to make. Uh, but we are saying if we want to to stop some of the changes that are going to continue to have an impact on people going uh, forward, then we need to uh, do things differently to what is currently planned in a range of areas. So there's no commitment to reverse, there's simply a commitment to take a different well, uh, direction in the future? Well, I don't have power. I wish I did have power over... If, if I had power over welfare right now, we wouldn't be doing some of the things that are having the impact we're talking about. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have that power. Now, I can't, with the best will in the world, uh, turn the clock back to restore uh, a link between benefits and the cost of living a year or, or two years ago, but I can say quite clearly that in future, if we have this responsibility, then we'll maintain that link so that uh, those on the lowest incomes don't continue to fall behind uh, the, the cost of... Their incomes don't continue to find, fall behind the cost of living, which helps to push more people into relative poverty. Yeah. I notice this report talks about CPI as being your measure. I remember when CPI was adopted, you were one of the ones that complained about the move from RPI. Is that change from RPI to CPI no, no longer significant? We, the expert group, and we asked the expert group to look at these things, has recommended that the link should be with CPI. Mm. Okay. Kevin. Kevin? Sorry, it was Kevin. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, thank you, uh, convener. Uh, good morning, Deputy First Minister. You said um, at the beginning of, of your statement that trust has broken down, and I, argue, I would argue that trust is broken down and been replaced by fear um, in many places because of the Westminster uh, government's welfare changes. Um, uh, Mr Hepburn touched upon work capability assessments and uh, uh, there seems to be a real fear round about them and in a recent visit uh, to the MS Society in Aberdeen uh, assessments was one of the, the big issues uh, that kept coming up 
again and again, not just uh, work capability assessments, but assessments uh, that are going to take place with the changes from DLA to PIP. How do we overcome that fear uh, and how do we ensure that any assessments that are done in the future are, are done fairly uh, and without the involvement of private enterprise? Well, you know, I, I, I'm quite clear in my mind that as we take uh, responsibility for these areas of policy, then, you know, I think any system of assessment of people with disabilities uh, has to be done in a way that uh, recognises the kind of clinical specialism that is involved. So, you know, clinicians have to be involved and that's something the expert group was very clear about as well. Um, and, you know, I, I don't think this is an area uh, that is right for outsourcing uh, to the private sector. Um, I think in the expert group uh, was, I think, been very clear about its views around the breakdown of trust and the fact that many people uh, who are in the, the broader social security system feel very, you know, scared and uncertain. Uh, that's going to take time to, to rebuild, uh, but I think that's why the experts group focus, expert groups focus on principles, on what any welfare system should be trying to achieve is so important because you're starting to work from a, a system of, of first principles um, as opposed to what we've got into in this country, uh, which is the characterisation of everybody who's in the social security system as somehow a, a scrounger or a skiver, uh, somebody who's ripping off the taxpayer uh, and is capable of working. I mean, let me be very, very clear. The benefit system shouldn't be a free ride for anybody who's capable of, of work. Uh, you know, there is no doubt at all that we want people who can work to work when they're in work, we want them to be paid uh, a decent wage so that they are less dependent on top-ups uh, from the, the state. Uh, but there, will, there are people, uh, particularly people with long-term disabilities, for whom work is not that route out of poverty. And we've got to make sure that these people um, are dealt with in a system that is uh, personal, that is uh, respectful of their dignity and doesn't uh, create this climate of fear and uncertainty that exists for a lot of disabled people right now. Uh, one of the things which came up again and again was that um, changes to the system itself uh, may actually be much more costly for the state. Um, and I'll, I'll give you a, an example um, where folk there were saying that if there was massive changes from DLA to PIP, money was lost and uh, folks' independence uh, was taken away from them in terms of travel and other things, that may mean that a relative has to give up work and care for them. How do we ensure uh, that in future in, in independent Scotland that we get uh, these strategies right to ensure that we allow folk to, to keep their independence um, and allow them, uh, uh, their, their relatives, to continue to work if that's possible, allow uh, individuals with disabilities to work with uh, that payment? I think the answer to that has a, a number of different strands. I think, you know, and it goes back to, you know, things we're already grappling with in, you know, in terms of our devolved responsibilities about the better alignment of different services, whether that's health and social care, uh, you know, uh, employability services, you know, all of that is really important to make sure, you know, that we don't have a situation that many carers do just now where, you know, the, the cut-off points and carers' allowance mean that, you know, if they work over a certain amount of time, they lose completely. There's a cliff edge there. We need to make sure all these things join up uh, much better. But I increasingly think, and you know, certainly my thinking on this has been uh, developed by this report we're talking about just now, that we need a really fundamental kind of look at how we support people with disabilities. Because right now, uh, you know, people with disabilities, they are, you know, sort of in the general kind of welfare system, uh, you know, often being uh, treated uh, in a way uh, that is driven by, you know, the desire to get people off benefits and I've already said where people uh, should be in work they absolutely should be expected uh, to work but you know often you know dis disabled people right now feel very caught up in this you know idea that anybody in receipt of state benefits is somehow 
a, a scrounger or, or a, a skiver and we've got to get away from that and I think I'm very, very attracted to what the expert group has said about looking very discreetly at long-term disabled people and how we support them to have independence, to have a decent quality uh, of life uh, in a way that helps lift them out of poverty. Now, there's a lot of work to be done around that. I'm not sitting here saying we've got all of the, the answers to how we do that, but the opportunity to, to look at that in a very different way, I think, is one that will open up to us, and we should take it. Convener, I think it would be fair to say that the evidence that we've taken uh, from folks with long-term conditions, and certainly um, speaking to folk, uh, like uh, at the MS Society event that I was talking about earlier, you know, people want to work for as long as they possibly uh, can and retain their independence. And I, th I think this is what's so sad about uh, the situation that we find ourselves in with this Westminster reform, where everybody um, seems to be uh, tarred as a, as a scrounger or a skyver, which I think is absolutely ridiculous. Um, in terms of the bringing together of uh, the current Westminster <coughs> welfare responsibilities um, and some of the devolved responsibilities uh, that, that we've got. Do you think that that realignment of services uh, oper offers real opportunities uh, to provide better services and better welfare for our disabled people? It, it does, and that, for me, is something that kind of applies across a, a whole range of different policies. I mean, it, it, you know, it doesn't sound the most exciting of arguments, but you know, often uh, what you find when you've got, you know, some powers held at Westminster, some powers held here, is you've got a real dislocation. So, you know, the split between employability responsibilities and uh, some of the, the other responsibilities of the Scottish Government in the field you're talking about, you know, many of the changes uh, to uh, support for disabled people that are being driven by Westminster, you know, Westminster will see them as cutting costs to Westminster. But the implication of that will be a transfer of those costs to areas that the Scottish Government is responsible for, whether that's health or local authority, because you know that has to be picked up somewhere in the system. So the ability to bring all of this together, to see this in a holistic way, lends itself to you know much better solutions to how we support people in what is one of the most vulnerable groups that we have to cater for. So an end to the current scenario of Westminster, on, uh, in many cases, cost shunting onto other public bodies, which often leads to greater uh, public costs. Be, but beyond that, huge costs to people's lives because there's yeah. not that holistic approach. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying that happens automatically. We know from our own experience how difficult that is between health and social care. And, you know, we're uh, working now to, to integrate those things. And so even in areas that are already devolved, that there, there can be, if you uh, don't get the right structural uh, set up, there can be the tendency to do that. But, you know, the first step is to, to have responsibility for all these areas so that you can look at how you align um, and integrate the different services to provide the best outcome. It doesn't happen by magic. Um, and it's not always easy, uh, but we're going to have a better chance of doing it if we have all of these responsibilities in our own hands. Thank you, convener, and I welcome that opportunity. Okay. Uh, Ken Martin. Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, can I just begin, uh, if I can, Deputy First Minister, by talking about sanctions, which you mentioned earlier. Uh, the report was quite strong about um, abolishing the current system of sanctions, but it talks about replacing it with a system of conditionality. Uh, can I just ask you to explain the difference between sanctions and conditionality? Well, you know, in terms of you know basic terminology, sanctions is a form of conditionality. So you don't get benefit unless you do certain things, and benefit can be removed. Uh, the problem with the current sanctions regime is the way it's being uh, applied, where it's being applied, in my view, very indiscriminately. It's been applied uh, in circumstances where people actually need more support. So a single mother ending up being sanctioned because they haven't a childcare uh, and haven't been able to, to do the things that they're required to do. That makes no sense. So, you know, the report talks about a more supportive approach here. So if you get into a situation where somebody is over time just willfully not uh, engaging with the system, then I think everybody would accept there has to be a degree of conditionality there. But the, the focus, the first uh, instinct should not be as it is just now or how it appears to be very often just now, which is, you know, just take any excuse to slap a sanction on somebody, but instead work with that person to understand what the barriers are and try to have a system that helps people overcome these barriers. Um, and, you know, 
like all aspects of this report, is if we take responsibility here and are putting these systems in place, then there's a, a, a lot of work requires to be done in terms of the detail of that and you know, the national convention that has been talked about is an important part of that process. Um, but you know, it's not so much that there's a, 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 a strict line between sanctions and conditionality. Sanctions is a form of that, but it's how it's been applied at the moment, um, and in my view, deliberately applied in this way that is so deeply wrong and counterproductive. And perhaps that's the bit that's not talked about as much. We talk understandably about the impact on people, but the counterproductive nature of the way sanctions are applied in terms of not providing support to help people back into work, I think is also uh, of considerable concern. Uh, can I thank you for that? Uh, you also mentioned earlier uh, the plans to increase carers' allowance. Um, can I just check, do you believe people will be better off <coughs> as a result of you increasing carers' allowance? Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. I, just, I, I mentioned that I, um, I've had some correspondence, somebody who believes that although care, one part of the carers' allowance will increase, another part will decrease. Is your understanding that they will definitely be better off as a result I, of this I, change? Uh, yes, but I, I said earlier on, I, I think there's other issues you have to look at in terms of how carers allowance interacts with other parts of, of the benefit system. Um, I don't think it's just the uh, the amount carers allowance is paid at that is an issue. I think there's issues I said earlier on about thresholds and such like. So I would want us to, as part of a, an overall approach to, to looking at uh, welfare and rethinking how we do welfare to, to look at some of these broader issues. But yes, I, I believe that uh, increasing the level of, of carers allowance uh, will make people on carers allowance uh, better off. And that was the view of the expert committee, uh, the expert group. Um, can I just ask uh, also, the, the First Minister, uh, when he was asked uh, last year if he supported the benefits cap, he suggested, he, he said, sorry, quote, if you have the right cap deployed in the right way, then that is a reasonable thing to have. Do you agree with that statement? Uh, well, what he was saying was there were, you know, he was putting a couple of ifs there and saying those ifs weren't satisfied in terms of the benefit cap uh, we're talking about. Uh, so he was drawing a distinction between some kind of theoretical discussion around whether there was a ever any uh, merit in uh, an approach like that and the specific uh, situation that we have just now. I think what the expert group proposes here is is better than. The, the benefit cap approach that the UK government is taking, where there's an onus on uh, government uh, at certain points during every parliamentary term to report to parliament on the level of social security expenditure and obviously have a responsibility to explain any uh, particular changes in that. And, and that is an approach that I favour over the one that's currently deployed. Uh, I, I appreciate that the, the First Minister did put particular caveats in, but with the caveats they put in, do you agree with the point he made? Uh, the government, uh, which includes the First Minister, agrees with the expert group, which uh, has laid out an alternative approach, which is a, a responsibility on uh, government. I mean, the, the benefit cap that the UK will, will remains to be seen how they uh, how they implement that, and you know what uh, happens when they breach it whether they'll just allow it to go by the wayside or whether they'll cut people's benefits, which I suppose if it's to be meaningful for them, for their purposes, you would have to assume they will do, which is uh, very worrying. Uh, but the government's view is that we favour the approach that's set out in the expert group's report. Yeah, I, I agree, and, and I'll come back to that in a second. But just, just to clarify this, because it did cause some confusion at the time. So it's just to clarify, it's a very specific statement. If you have the right cap deployed in the right way, then that is a reasonable thing to have. Now, clearly, the reason for the First Minister saying that, to my mind, would be to indicate that he's not against some form of benefits cap. So think, just, just on, on the very specific uh -huh. wording he used, was he right to, to use those words? Do you agree with the words that he used? What I am saying, you know, I, I know what the First Minister was communicating here, is that you know, we accept that any government has to be responsible and accountable in terms of uh, spend around uh, the welfare budget as it does around spend in any other area uh, of government. But I think, you know, as you've demonstrated in the couple of times you've read that quote out, he was clearly not agreeing uh, with the approach that the current UK government is taking around the benefit cap. He was making a hypothetical statement about if you get, you know, a number of things right. Now, what the government is 
uh, position is, is that we agree that that accountability and that responsibility is more meaningfully exercised uh, and discharged in the way that the expert group is talking about in its report than it is through the approach that the UK government is taking. OK. I think some people would think he's trying to have it both ways, suggesting our, our form of benefits cap is reasonable. I think, you're, I think you're being too cynical there, if I may <laughs> say. I, I mean, it's I very unlikely, I have to say. Oh? <laughs> Highly unlikely. Unlike me, can I just ask as well the uh, final question? Really, um, the, the 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 group, the working group, uh, said that there would be no net additional costs, so that there would be some changes, there would be some additional costs, but there would be some savings too. But no net additional costs. Um, is that your view of the way the new system will work? It won't cost any more than the current well, system. I, I've, I've been, I mean, that's the view of the expert group. You've had the expert group mm. in front of you, and it's for the expert group to, you know, set out its its own thinking. It's, it's not for me to, to do that. Um, there are uh, things that we, and by we, I mean the government, obviously, not the expert group, are, are saying we want to do, which much of which draws on the recommendations of the expert group that have a cost implication. So... Carers' allowance, which is the, the, uh, one of the questions you asked me about, um, restoring the link with uh, the cost of living. Now, I should say that the UK government currently says it's going to do that in, I think, 2017-18. We'll see whether that transpires, but you know, they you know, are saying that they're going to do that, so presumably their projections include uh, a costing for that. So there are cost implications. You know, f We don't want to go ahead with personal independence payments and the loss of income for uh, groups of disabled uh, people that that will entail. But what the expert group is pointing to, and I think pointing to rightly, is that if you get other things right in your welfare system and if you do certain other things that are about tackling in-work poverty, then the savings you make uh, can uh, broadly uh, be equivalent to the cost implications uh, of that. And that's the point they're making in terms of the... the the broadly neutral uh, cost implications. But, you know, there are clearly uh, upfront cost implications of some of the things that we are uh, saying we want uh, to do. And, of course, we've taken, uh, we've said we would take a different approach to uh, public spending um, in terms of the growth of public spending in the years following independence. The current uh, UK government, I think, I may be wrong here, but I think the Labour oppos opposition have said they will stick to this 1% uh, growth. We've said that while uh, keeping our public finances sustainable with the deficit uh, on a downward trajectory as a share of uh, GDP, we can uh, aim for 3% growth uh, in public spending. We think that's more appropriate and, and more in terms of the interests of the overall growth of the economony. OK, so just to clarify, though, do you agree with the expert group findings? If, if we, yeah, I mean, obviously I've said that things like uh, the uh, moving from, uh, moving over time to having a minimum wage that equals the living wage is something we're looking sympathetically at. Obviously, we've got to look at the timing of that. Uh, but yes, I agree if you can uh, do the things. It doesn't happen. What, what I'm just being trying to be very frank about is that these things don't happen just by waving some kind of magic wand or, you know, clicking your fingers. You have to get these things right. But if you get these things right, for example, uh, we've not gone into the detail of this yet, but a lot of what the expert group is talking about, uh, about, you know, the, the failings of the current work programme and the need to spend more of your resource on those that are furthest away from the labour market to help them into work. If you do that, if you tackle some of the need for uh, the state to subsidise low pay by raising uh, levels of wages, then yes, I, I do think the right that you know a sustainable welfare system uh, doesn't require to be one that is uh, the bill for which is is constantly rising. It's just about using money better and making savings in order to ensure that the money you are spending on welfare is getting to those who need it most. Thank you very much. Okay. Jackie Bailey. Thank you very much, convener. Um, can I join with the Deputy First Minister in welcoming the efforts of the members of the expert group on welfare? Um, can I pursue, firstly, a carer's allowance? Um, because I think the press release from the Scottish Government indicated that 102,000 people would benefit. I think you know, Ken McIntosh has, has set out that the reality is that would be actually less because some people in receipt of carer's benefit, um, won't carer's allowance, won't receive it because it's offset against other benefits. Could the Deputy First Minister therefore confirm that actually the actual figure of those who would benefit is 57,000? 
Um, I'm not... I'm, I'm more than happy to look at what Jackie Bailey's putting forward to me and reply to her in writing on the detail of that. Um, but I would remind her that what I've said is that... And I, I would hope there would be an agreement here that raising the level of mm -hmm. carers' allowance is the right thing to do. Um, but there are other aspects of how carers' allowance interacts with the benefit system that we require to look at, because the intention here is to help people who are eligible for carers' allowance. So, you know, this is one of the many areas where, if we get into the scenario of having the responsibility to do this, I'm sure Jackie Bailey will be very keen to work with the government, or will, if Jackie Bailey is in the first government of an independent Scotland, I will be very keen to work with her to make sure we implement these kind of changes in a way that is about benefiting as many people as possible, because the intention is very clearly to do that. I am as ever keen to work with the government. Um, I question whether they are quite so keen to work with me, but you know, maybe there is a new dawn. Can I perhaps share? There will be the a new dawn if we vote yes. First Minister. <laughs> Even I don't on the think question so, of working but, but with you. Can I say? I think clarity, whether whatever the constitutional outcome, clarity is important. And I'm um, perfectly to the people clear of about what we can, said. But you're, you're asking me to. Yeah. Can, and I'm, can I'm I share with you a piece figures. of information? Of um, the national statistics distinguish between the number of cases where carers' allowances in payment. And that's 57,000 in Scotland and entitlement only cases. So they talk about number of 57,000. I just think it's important in terms of clarity um, for carers sitting at home that, that we have a clear number. Could I move on, convener, to set up costs? It's been suggested by experts um, that there would be set up costs for an IT system. Now, I know you, you made a distinction between investment and otherwise, but you would need a different IT system to administer a changed benefit system in Scotland. The suggestion was that that was 300 to 400 million. Um, is, that some, is that a figure that you would agree I'm, I'm not with? going to uh, put a figure on that because, as Professor Dunleavy said, we require to have information from and discussion with the UK government before we can uh, do that, and they're the ones that are refusing to, to do that. But you know, I, I would you know, certainly recommend Professor Dunleavy's work on this because he clearly Maybe. makes the distinction between what, are, what he terms pure setup costs, the things that you don't get back because they are just associated with setting things up and you and investment costs. And he makes the point that in terms of computer systems, well, firstly, I'm not just talking about welfare here, uh, government's in control of the, the pace and speed at which it chooses to do that. It involves putting into place systems that are fit for purpose and can deliver efficiency savings over time. He also makes the point that, of course, uh, as part of the UK, systems are uh, periodically updated and we pay our share of that uh, right now. So, you know, that uh, I wouldn't describe as a setup cost, as an investment cost that a Scottish government would make to make sure we've got fit for purpose uh, systems to administer our welfare system. Um, whatever you describe it as, and I'm happy to go with alternative descriptions, does the sum 300 to 400 million um, fit? Uh, let, no, I'm not. That's not a figure. Don't I don't know, know the cost. It, well, I've, I've already said to you, and we've had this discussion across a range of issues on setup costs. I am perfectly uh, ready and willing to go and talk to the UK government. I'm happy to clear my diary and do that at a point of their choosing uh, if they want us to be able to bring uh, more clarity. But as Professor Dunleavy uh, said, you know, the, the barrier to doing that right now is an inability and an unwillingness on the part of the UK government to enter into these discussions. Okay. Um, I think you would agree that the expert group's first report, their interim report, um, suggested that as a way of avoiding risk, that for a transitional period, you should share the UK system. Nevertheless, you've said quite clearly that the Scottish Government would wish to make a priority change to Social Security immediately following separation. If you can't use the existing system, because sharing a system where you're going in a different direction becomes difficult, um, how do you propose to consult, legislate, design, build and test systems within a period of you know, 18 months, two years, however long it would take? Well, we will you know, do what requires to be done to uh, move from a system of shared uh, administration to a system where we are able uh, to start the process of implementing uh, the kind of welfare system we want. Um, as is evidenced by the experience in Northern Ireland, it is possible within shared systems to make changes. Uh, Northern Ireland uh, has opted to make some of these changes um, already. Um, you know, we may uh, be able to 
do that uh, through a shared uh, IT system for, for longer, but we won't know that until we can have that proper uh, discussion. But we're very clear that we want to be in a position uh, within a very short period of time of being able to start the process of making the significant changes that I think we all want to see to a Scottish welfare system as quickly as possible. And, and interesting, the... the um example you give, because Northern Ireland, of course, would remain in the United Kingdom um, and benefits would be paid in sterling. There is no such clarity um, with the position adopted by the Scottish so, Government. For, for the record, convener, yes, there is. <laughs> well, there you go. Um, we could do yes, there is, no, there is, or well, no, there isn't all I day, but, but I, will avoid, I will avoid that. Can I ask why the expert group and indeed the Government um, has previously and currently used um, GDP as a measure of welfare affordability? Well, it's a standard measure of how you determine the affordability of things within an economy is the proportion of your economy uh, that that makes up. Uh, you know, and on that measurement, not only is welfare more affordable uh, in Scotland than in the rest of the UK, but also than in many other OECD countries. Um, it's interesting then that your own fiscal commission suggested that comparisons of GDP per capita, including North Sea oil, should be viewed with caution, as much of the output from North Sea oil we know flows overseas. So an alternative well, measure that they support, which is your own fiscal commission, um, that accounts for this is gross national income. And there have been a number of independent economists that have suggested that that would be a better, more realistic well, measure. You know, I... I'm not aware uh, that uh, Labour have decided that GDP is suddenly not a, a relevant measure of no, the I'm economy's asking. wealth. I'll, experts I'll remember that the next time I hear Ed Miliband talk about the latest GDP figures. Can I just interrupt? Because, you know, it, I don't think this is funny. This is about whether... Laughing, but, no, but your members are. This is about whether um, a system is affordable and judged by independent economists as being affordable. I know you would treat that question seriously. Well... Let me answer it in, in two different ways. I, I find the uh, assertion that we seem to hear more and more often from Labour that Scotland can't be independent because we no, can't afford anything to be no, deeply, no. deeply insulting yeah. to people across yeah. uh, this country. We pay for the services that we currently enjoy in Scotland from the taxes and the national insurance contributions that we already uh, make. And I know Jackie Bailey will be aware of the fact that uh, for every single one of the past 30-odd years, we've generated more tax per head of population than has been the case elsewhere in the UK. So the idea that Scotland is somehow subsidised, that the only reason we can have a welfare system right now or a pension system is because there's a money tree in London sending us up free money, um, is just you know, got no basis in fact, and I think people find it quite uh, insulting. We pay for our welfare system right now, and we will do that uh, in an independent Scotland. And the uh, measurement of uh, our country's wealth, uh, you know, the tax uh, revenues from North Sea oil and gas uh, don't flow overseas, they flow to Me the too. Treasury in London, and frankly are as likely to be spent on uh, nuclear weapons and whatever else George Osborne wants to spend them on than on things that are actually for the betterment of people in Scotland. So uh, Scotland can afford uh, a welfare system, but the real benefit of being independent with powers over welfare uh, is that we get the chance to decide how those resources are spent in a way that actually uh, benefits the people who depend on that system. And, you know, Jackie Bailey can continue to defend the right of Tory governments to dismantle our welfare state. Um, she's perfectly entitled to do that, but I actually prefer to argue for Scotland taking responsibility to build the kind of system that I think we should be proud to have. See, it's interesting, I find, that the Deputy First Minister didn't answer the question because none of what she said was actually indicated as an opinion by myself. What I merely wanted to know is why the measure used of GDP, um, one that has been criticised by the government's own economists as well as independent ones, is the one that's used. Well, Jackie, but, you know, I'm clearly not going to get an answer no, to let this. Me, so. uh, let me, Jackie Bailey, you know, wants to cite... Uh, independent uh, advisors. The expert, the expert group on welfare is a group of independent advisors to the Scottish Government, unless she's impugning something else. They are independent and they have said that the welfare system uh, in Scotland is affordable because they've used uh, the GDP uh, calculation that is perfectly uh, valid. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm not sure, I can't recall if this uh, was a point pursued uh, by the expert group the, the, when they were here, but I'm perfectly sure they would be uh, very uh, keen and able uh, to stand uh, aside the judgment.
judgment that they've made in the report. That's very helpful. So your own fiscal commission is therefore wrong. No, I, Jackie well, Bailey. They're saying the opposite. Jackie Bailey can tie herself in knots in trying to make this argument no. that Scotland is somehow too poor I to be independent, but the facts do not bear it out, uh, and that's the reality that she'll keep running okay. into in you, a pretty you, headlong I, I, fashion. I have to say, I didn't make that argument. I was simply asking the deputy first minister. But I'll move on. Um, can I ask about um, transitioning benefits like ESA, DLA, or PIP? Um, would you envisage that there is a requirement for reassessment? We have to, uh, and again, I would hope this is, is common sense, we have to see uh, the state that you know, the transition to universal credit and PIP is at by the time we become independent. Now, I, I still don't have a clear sense of what the uh, timescale is going to be and how many people uh, are going to have moved on to a new system. Uh, but, you know, for people who uh, have not made that transition, uh, we will not carry on with that uh, with that uh, transition and therefore there will be no need uh, at that stage for an a reassessment of people in DLA. Okay. But if people have made the transition, um, would there re be a requirement for reassessment? We, we have to, you know, I, I can't... <coughs> this is where, you know, I have to... Uh, be mindful of what is going to have happened with a process that I'm not in control of. Uh, I don't want to put people through... I, I would rather uh, the UK government wasn't going ahead with this botched uh, reform. If there's a yes vote in September, I hope they will respect that and not continue with the roll out of PIP uh, in that intervening period so that we may have uh, very, very small numbers in that position and we'll make a judgment then about uh, that situation. But we have to see what situation we inherit in terms of the numbers of people that have been transitioned onto a new benefit. But it's not in my uh, interest. And, uh, you know, given the anxiety we were talking about earlier on in the part of disabled people of putting people through uh, assessments that are unnecessary. OK. Um, can I move on to pensions? And I'll make this my last question, convener. Um, it, I, I'm very conscious that pensions weren't considered by the expert working group yet. They make up a third, I think. Um, uh, you'll correct me if I'm wrong. A third of all social security expenditure. So clearly um, they are quite central to, to future discussions. I know John Swinney set up a working group to look at the affordability of pensions. Um, when will that report um, and will that work dovetail in with the expert groups? There is no working group looking at the affordability of, of pensions. The oh. Scottish Government's paper on pensions was published, I think, last September. I'm pretty sure Jackie Bailey's read it. OK. There's not a working group? Looking at the affordability of pensions, no. OK. Sorry, I must mm -hmm. have been misinformed. Okay. Well, thank you, Kavir. Uh, and good morning again, uh, Deputy First Minister. Um, yeah, just on the point, I mean, just as a matter of clarity, for not all of us sitting around the table today who actually attended the meeting with the expert working group to put questions, take the opportunity to put questions to them, I don't think Ms Bailey was able to do that. Um, Martin Evans said clearly at page 1565, the taxes that are raised in Scotland pay for our system already. We are already paying for it. I don't think it could be much clearer uh, than that. But I, I, we've touched on a lot of issues today, and I think that's been extremely helpful. Uh, I don't want to waste your time and the committee's time going over issues that have already been raised. What I would like to do is more of a broad brush uh, question. And um, what is clear is that we have discussed the purpose of a social security system, and it has been emphasised that inter alia that should include uh, the system as a springboard to get people into work, and that is very important. And also, of course, it's a, a safety net. And indeed, Martin Evans said at our committee meeting on the 24th of June, uh, we propose that the, the purpose for an independent Scottish social security system must be to provide a safety net through which individuals cannot um, fail. Uh, and uh, he also went on to say he the, and the expert working group had heard evidence of a widespread will to build a new system that is fit for purpose and progressive. Uh, in that regard, uh, Deputy First Minister, I would like to quote um, from a, a witness that was brave enough to come to our committee uh, uh, to talk about their experience, their family's experience of the benefit system. I did read out this quote when we had the uh, Under Secretary of State for Scotland, David Mundell, here on the 26th of June. He uh, regrettably seemed to be in denial about what this lady was trying to say, and perhaps I could just, for the record, read it out again. And it was uh, a Leslie McMurchie, 
who uh, made a comment about her husband's experience, who had had a number of mental health and physical problems, but was found to be fit for work. And inter alia, she said, I am a history graduate, and I thought that when we set up the welfare state, it was to be there for people such as my husband, who worked hard and did his best, so that in times of need, something would be there for him. But it is not there. And she went on to say, there should be something there for those hardworking men and women who have contributed to society. They are being left with nothing. Surely at the heart of our debate today are the positions of people like Leslie McMurtry's husband. Because what we have to do, surely, and I would ask then the Deputy First Minister to confirm that that is her vision for the social security system of an independent uh, Scotland, that what we want to create is a system that is based on dignity uh, and is part of a system of a civilised country and not leaving people like Mr McMurtry to fall through a safety net. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, you have to judge the efficacy and the efficiency and the, the dignity of, of any system like this on whether it can provide uh, the safety net for the kind of person that you've just spoken about. And, you know, what concerns me so deeply about what's happening to the social security system in this country right now is that, that you know, to put it as charitably as I can, the safety net is developing large gaping holes where lots of people uh, are falling right through it and you know that is not right it's not right from the perspective of the people who are falling through the safety net but nor is it right for society as a whole because it benefits nobody if we've got you know people uh, particularly people with disabilities who are in that position the burden falls somewhere else it will fall principally on their family who care for them it will fall on the health service it will fall on local authority services um, and you know that's why um, I thought the expert group's characterization of what a benefit system should be there to do was was very powerful it should be a safety net it should be there to uh, protect people against you know life's unexpected twists and turns but it should also be a springboard you know I feel very strongly that, that the benefit system shouldn't be abused it shouldn't be exploited it shouldn't be there uh, to, to help folk who just can't be bothered getting out of their bed to go to work um, but there are a lot of people right now uh, in benefits who want to work who can't work who are working but not earning enough and we need to reorientate the system to help those people much more than the system we've got right now does, as well as ensuring that safety net for those who, through no fault of their own, find themselves in a position where work is not an option for them. Thank you. Um, can I uh, ask just another, a couple of other points uh, on issues that, that Martin Evans raised when he, he was here? He said that he hoped people would be better helped into work by the proposed welfare changes in, in their report. Um, I understand this morning that um, the Cabinet Secretary for Finance is announcing proposals for an increase in employment. Um, can you tell us whether that, the increased figure that he is indicating this morning includes uh, increases in, uh, in relation to the, the childcare proposals that you put forward? Because I think there was an indication that that would increase employment. So is the figure that the, the Cabinet Secretary is using this morning does it include the projected increase in the number of people who would gain employment through the childcare changes that you envisage? Well, the Cabinet Secretary for Finance is setting out uh, today uh, an aspiration, which I would hope you would agree with, that yeah. we should be aspiring to full employment. Uh, and what he's doing is setting out what we need to do as a, a country in order to, over time, work towards that. And yes, childcare and making the provision of childcare much uh, better than it is just now is a key part of what we consider we need to do to get more people into work, as is having the right tax incentives in place to encourage more businesses to locate here and expand here to provide the opportunities. So that's all part of a package of the things you need to do as an economy to become a higher employment, hopefully full employment economy with greater levels of productivity and participation in the labour market. I think everyone would agree in the aspiration, but having an aspiration is not necessarily the same as having a specific figure. And apparently there is a specific figure being placed this morning on the record. There was a specific figure given in relation to the childcare um, changes, but we subsequently discovered that no modelling was done under which those uh, figures were uh, arrived at. So is the, the projection, because if we're talking about getting people back into work and we're talking about the numbers that the Cabinet Secretary is, 
is there modelling on which we can test that against the aspiration that, that we all agree uh, we should have? Well, you know, we're, we're setting out an aspiration, and I absolutely agree with you. Setting out an aspiration doesn't let you achieve that aspiration, but we're setting out across a range of things, childcare included, uh, how we get towards that. You know, by having control over our uh, spending and our revenue so that we do have the ability to transform childcare and reap the economic benefits of that, to have the tax levers to incentivise different sectors of our economy and encourage uh, jobs growth. All of these things, they don't happen by magic, but they don't happen at all if you don't have the ability to put in place the policies to make them happen. So if the committee wants any more detail of any of the aspects in the paper that John Swinney is publishing today, we'll be happy uh, to provide that. But this is about, as a country, setting ourselves uh, the ambition of what we want to achieve, of having confidence in the skills of our people uh, and the wisdom of whatever government it would be to take the right decisions when we've got the hands on uh, the levers of power and have an access to our resources to say, do you know what, we can do better than we're doing right now. We've done pretty well on the economic front, notwithstanding all the difficulties with limited powers. We can do a lot better if we have the full economic powers that come with being independent. But would you agree if you're putting specific figures on uh, what, what we can expect, then there should have been some modelling that we can look at the, to see I'm how those I'm more than happy to provide, at. if there's particular aspects of what has been published today that the committee wants more uh, detail and information of the government's working around that, I'm, I'm more than happy to provide that. Because will the, the Cabinet Secretary agree that if we're going to consider the Welfare Commission's report, and uh, central to that is getting people back into work, we have to test the the capacity of the, the report to achieve its outcome against the figures that are being given by the Cabinet Secretary. Uh, absolutely, and you know why I'm here is to talk about these things, and we'll you know move forward in a way that is about ensuring uh, that we're trying to reach the objectives we're reaching. But you know the first thing we have to do is we have to get control of the powers, because all we're talking about today, about the opportunities of building a better system in Scotland, is academic if we don't first get the powers to do it, because it will still be a Tory government in Westminster going completely in the opposite direction to the one that I think probably all of us around this table, with maybe one exception, I don't know, uh, wants to, to go in. Okay, and, and one final question. Um, the, the, the figures that, that we've been working on, you know, in the, in the, from the Welfare Commission report, Martin Evans talked about where they could come from, but one thing he was very specific about was to say that we couldn't look abroad and transplant yeah. systems from other countries to here to achieve those outcomes. Do you agree with him? Um, I mean, I, I think the comments he made in that respect and the comments the report makes are, are pretty sensible. You know, they, they do say we can learn lessons from other places, and I think we should all be... Uh, keen and willing to learn lessons where we can. What they say, and uh, you know, I would I would say that this is is common sense. You can't simply transplant, you know, one system from one country and assume that that will work in Scotland with the differences that we have here. But that doesn't mean you don't look to learn lessons and learn from how the best do these things. No, I think we we'll, we can agree on that. Mm -hmm. um, we are slightly ahead of schedule. Jackie Bailey wanted to ask a supplementary, so I'll allow you one short question, Jackie. Thank you. And it will be very short, I promise. Um, I accept that there have been difficulties for the Cabinet Secretary in costing all of the paper. Have you been able to cost any of it? And if so, what are the costs that, that the, you've arrived at? The expert group lays out uh, where uh, it considers the cost implications in both directions are. Um, you know, the specific changes that are being recommended here uh, are are costed and the carers allowance is, is the obvious one of that but as we uh, move forward we do that in a, a holistic way that looks at uh, the savings we can make from lifting people out of poverty who are in work for example as well as the cost implications okay um can i thank the cabinet secretary mm -hmm. and her officials for coming before us this morning i certainly found an interesting discussion i hope she did uh, too and, and uh, thanks very much for for your time thank you I'll suspend the meeting now uh, before we go into our discussion on the work programme. Thanks. It's a private session at that point, so we have to clear the, the gallery.